Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Yan Qingyang. It is a great pleasure for me to be here to uh, moderate this session. Uh, and we know that transparency, accountability, and the free of the graft is something ideal we want for our uh, economic and political uh, society and system. But uh, uh, the reality is that we have been plagued by the uh, enduring uh, and corruption uh, in, in uh, all across the globe. And also Asia is not immune to this reality, obviously. Although catching up very quickly, but this region continues to be ranked behind the advanced economy according to their uh, accountability and the transparency issue. And more worryingly, swift economic growth may give more room for the uh, more tolerance for the uh, corruption and also the less transparency and less accountability. Uh, the evidence is that according to the uh, uh, World Economic Forum Global Competitive Report, the, uh, uh, the institu institutional index for the uh, uh, several countries in Asia, including China, <coughs> India, Indonesia, and also Philippines, uh, Vietnam, and also Myanmar, the index of the institution is more or less behind of the overall institution or overall index of the uh, competitiveness is kind of evidence of that they, uh, maybe we should pay more attention to the, uh, uh, this issue. And so uh, what kind of strategy should leaders adopt to tackle this issue and also create a culture of the transparency accountability uh, in all these fronts? This is the core question we're going to answer this morning during this session. And also I uh, want to uh, share with you now that the, uh, this session is linked to Apache, uh, which is the partnering uh, against a corruption initiative of the forum. And I'm very happy to let you know that Elaine, the leader uh, of this uh, initiative, has agreed to introduce the Apache very briefly here. And uh, that's warmly welcome, Elaine. And uh, the floor is yours one, for one minute. Thank you. Thanks, uh, and welcome uh, to the session. Just very briefly, uh, Patchy uh, started about 10 years ago. It's a program that includes more than 100 CEOs in the forum who've signed on to a zero tolerance <coughs> policy around corruption within their own organizations. But that serves as the framework, as the basis for engaging in a much broader regional and global dialogue around anti-corruption and transparency. So we'd be happy to talk to anyone who's interested in Patchy, what we do. Uh, where we're going with our initiative and the kinds of uh, organizations who are engaged. So thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Elaine. Now it's time for us, uh, for, for me to uh, briefly introduce our distinguished panel here. Uh, to my uh, left uh, is Mr. Asanga. He has a very long surname, which is <laughs> Aiyagong Nasikara. I hope that's correct. <laughs> 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 Who is from uh, Indonesia, uh, from Thanks. Sri Lanka, I'm sorry. And uh, next to him, uh, Stephen Fox, uh, who, um, I'm sorry, uh, the Asanga is the executive director of the LKIIRSS, also a very long name of the organization. <laughs> <laughs> next to him, uh, Stephen Fox, managing partner of Veracity Worldwide, is from the United States. And also next to him, um, very honorable Flong Sia uh, Abad, Secretary of the Budget and Management of the Philippines. And uh, next to him, uh, Mr. Serge Pan. Uh, he can speak a very perfect, Chi uh, perfect Chinese. He's the chairman of the Serge Pan and Associates in, uh, from Myanmar. And also uh, uh, Dan uh, Rangdi, uh, he's the chair and the director of the project of, um, on prosperity and the development of the famous uh, organization think tank CSIS. And uh, the last but not least, Ernest uh, Sangdi Jana, uh, he's uh, the, the only global, a uh, brilliant global shaper on, in our panel and he's the principal of the uh, Boston Consulting Group of Indonesia. Now let me uh, start with uh, uh, Secretary uh, Abad. A uh, good news for you is that the Philippines is now a rising star in this region. And also we know that the all three rating agencies have raised uh, the credit rating of the sovereign debt of this country to investment level, which is triple B. And actually I had an interview with the, uh, uh, the Secretary of the Finance, uh, um, Pri, uh, Pri Sima, and he said that the, the good governance 
uh, translate it and contribute it to the uh, good economic growth. Do you agree with him? <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's absolutely <laughs> correct. <laughs> no, seriously, uh, this administration has been vigorously pursuing good governance uh, reform since its uh, inception. And, and because of that, I think we've been able to achieve something that is so fundamental in any state that's pursuing reforms, which is really the uh, restoration of the trustworthiness of government. And that's seen in the unprecedented uh, approval as well as uh, trust rating of this administration. And because of that, uh, without even having to increase taxes, uh, uh, except for the you know, sin tax reforms, and without even having to borrow more, we are borrowing less, we've managed to uh, uh, invest in unprecedented terms in social protection, social services like public education, public health, basic education, public health, social housing, and even infrastructure. And, and, and as a result of that, uh, the economy has grown. Uh, last year, it was 7.2%. And that's really founded on, really, uh, on a platform of good governance. And that's why this government uh, strongly believes that, uh, that that platform has to continue to be that platform for the next two and a half years as we pursue this time around a more focused uh, uh, investments on inclusive development, not just simply economic growth. So I think uh, that is really the foundation upon which uh, this uh, performance, this, this renewed confidence and, and, and trust, not just of the people, but even of the investing public on the Philippines right now. And I think overall, uh, Philippine has made a, a particular uh, progress and uh, a brilliant progress in the economic growth and also uh, to the governance. But you are in charge of the budget. And what kind of the uh, uh, particular uh, fronts in here for you have contributed to this, govern to this governance? Maybe tra more transparency, more accountability? We have, we have three objectives in the budget department. We want to be able to spend within our means spend on the right priorities, and spend with measurable outcomes. And in all those three, we have been able to do, in my view, rather well. You know, we, have, we have been able to, com to stay committed to our fiscal consolidation program, so we've stayed within our deficit cap commitments. Our priorities are firmly focused on, uh, on uh, the improvement of the delivery of basic social services as well as the <laughs> expansion of the economy. And right now, we've, we're, we're introducing uh, unprecedented reforms in the budget process from uh, you know, budget preparation where we involve civil society organizations, where we insist that uh, uh, on a performance-informed uh, budget process to budget execution, we are improving on uh, spending, uh, and, and as a result, yeah, that's recognized by the ratings agencies, as well as making sure that uh, you know, we're able to uh, monitor and report outcomes uh, of, of the uh, government spending. And we've done that uh, quite well, I, I, I believe. And also, uh, is anti-corruption issue is on the priority of your agenda as well? Oh, certainly. From the very start, uh, you know, this, this, this government has put uh, in detention a former president, has. Uh, convicted uh, of, of Chief Justice and has removed from office an ombudsman. And I think that message comes across very well among our people that this government is serious. Really uh, encouraging uh, news from the Philippines. Now let's move on to the uh, uh, other countries in Asia. Uh, shall we start with uh, uh, Myanmar? What kind of progress has been made there? Well, I, I'll try to, to, to touch on the subject which is probably um, a very significant subject in our country um, by giving you a background of how our reforms have started actually. Unlike um, many uh, emerging markets uh, in the past 30 years where economic reform takes a major sort of uh, place, uh, Myanmar started its first two years of reform since the new government came to power solely on political and social reforms. Uh, if you look at our first legislation that was passed in the parliament, it was the labor law. And then it was the freedom of press law. And then it was the land rights issue. The foreign investment law actually came 
nearly 20 months later. Uh, and so in the process of doing social and political reform, one of the major agendas for our government was to create a level playing field, to end monopoly, cronyism, nepotism, uh, and to be transparent and anti-corruption. Now these were very big words, very big goals, but to the extent of uh, looking back today, I think our government has done tremendously well, uh, particularly given the context of Asia, and particularly given the background, historical background, of how we were in the past 20 years prior to this government. So today, I think we've made a lot of headway. Uh, as a businessman, I, I can um, personally feel and vouch that at the very top of our government, um, transparency, anti-corruption takes center stage. Uh, and we don't have to worry about paying anybody or dealing with that issue. Of course, eradicating or eliminating or even reducing corruption, I think it's a subject that will go on for a long time and requires more than just you know, theoretical or rhetoric. It requires structural reforms to the, to the government, the civil service, for instance, pay scale, uh, to the police force pay scale, um, to the um, uh, armed forces pay scale, and every, everything that goes with that. And without that, it's difficult. But having said that, I think uh, as a businessman, I think we're very, very happy of what we see today. I think it's very important to say that the uh, anti-corruption <coughs> fighting should be uh, uh, should be uh, conducted against the, the very big backdrop of the structural reform. I think it's very important. And also, what kind of the stories can we share from the uh, Indonesia and also from the Sri Lanka? Indonesia <coughs> first. Uh, I think I'll touch upon some of your introduction earlier by saying that I think Indonesia has been blessed with very vast economic growth over the last decade. So um, to a certain extent, many people were saying, yes, corruption is an issue, but um, it hasn't hampered our economic growth really. But the last few years, I think the mindset has shifted slightly because I think public expectation has actually gone up tremendously. Now people are talking about how do we become the major economic force in the region and how do we make sure the economic growth actually translates into the well-being of our people. And as a result, I think um, um, it's, people are actually taking the time to step back and stepping up the effort on anti-corruption activities in Indonesia. And progress has been made. If you look at our anti-corruption commission um, in the country, it has become one of the most respected public institutions in the country. You look at the number of cases that they have handled, um, it has improved tremendously. And it covers very senior ranking officials, cabinet members, um, parliament members, something that is unheard of just a, a decade ago in Indonesia. And secondly, I think we'll see that um, in the past few years um, in election, whether it's regional election or parliamentary election, that people no longer tolerate corrupt behaviors, that a lot of the new generation of leaders that are elected into office are those that have shown track record of uh, being clean and care about the people. So I think um, this has actually put a lot of pressure as well on government officials to um, think about it a little bit more because before they engage in corrupt activities, which is a good progress. And I think the last thing that I would also mention is on the private sector side, um, given the vast economic potentials, um, a lot of companies um, are actually um, thinking about growing aggressively. And as a result, they need access to financing as well as investors. And very often as they go abroad for funds, um, they are required to upgrade themselves in the level of governance that they need to have um, in their companies. And we have start seeing the next generation companies um, uh, are demonstrating transparency um, because they actually need to do so to compete on a global scale. Um, but one challenge I think for the country that I would also add is that a lot of the focus today um, in the country still focuses a lot on after the fact. Um, so you, we talk a lot about um, corruptors being put to justice, but not enough effort yet on preventing from act of corruption um, to begin with. 
And this is because a lot of the reform happens at the top level of the government and top level of uh, business leaders level, but it hasn't really gone down to the operative level, as, as Sergio mentioned earlier. Um, so I think one, one area that has been discussed in the country is that we need to look at this anti-corruption activity not only as an uh, end goal, but it's actually part of achieving the larger objective. So if, for example, government needs to provide um, better quality and more efficient public service. That should be the goal, not just um, um, stopping um, corruption from del uh, in delivering that public service. And this requires us to think about putting in metrics um, um, in the country, so because what gets measured gets done. So have a service standards for public services and make sure the operative level people are actually tracked against that. So if people want to renew their identity card, the service level is 24 hours and you are measured against it. And, um, and the effort is how to reduce that uh, turnaround time as opposed to just uh, reducing um, uh, corrupt activities. Great. But the great point is that the prevention also uh, in, in the first place is maybe more important than the uh, exposed uh, punishment. Then what about the story from Sri Lanka? Um, Sri Lanka, I think, um, after three decade war, so in 2009, um, the end of the war, so there's a tremendous growth in the economy. Um, you see a um, record number of tourist arrivals from 200,000 to about a million uh, within a short period of time. And um, in terms of corruption, fighting corruption, so uh, we have the institutions um, like the Bribery Commission, uh, Public Service Commissions, uh, many acts are there um, to fight corruption. So in the global uh, CPI index, uh, Sri Lanka is around 91. And regionally, if you look at it in South Asia, Sri Lanka is in a better position because after Bhutan, it's Sri Lanka, it's number two. Um, I think, uh, but uh, there are many issues because being in the government service for nine years, I've served for nine years, so there's many issues that the uh, agencies are facing. Uh, for example, um, the enforcement of uh, certain um, high-level officers need to be uh, low-level as well as high-level needs to be addressed because uh, none of the ministers or presidents have been arrested, um, so the highest level is not being looked at. Um, there are certain issues like uh, independence of the corrupt, uh, the fighting agencies. Um, so, uh, and uh, as well as, uh, but the media is well uh, reporting bribery, which is a good thing, and uh, it's coming on the front page always. And um, uh, I think uh, there are many tools uh, that is also s slowly coming in. Uh, one tool which I introduced, I paid a bribe, is getting uh, a bit popular. Um, so. Um, these are, I think, um, Sri Lanka uh, is a good platform where uh, we can introduce many things uh, regionally. And uh, because, I mean, back in the 70s, we had the, uh, the transparency, we have uh, acts, as well as uh, anti-money laundering. So we have uh, signed for those things. So I think um, there is, uh, um, corruption is still high, but uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, space for, um, uh, for the government administration to be efficient. So um, between um, the government officers, uh, to, there's, there's a key role that needs to be, uh, they need to play. Uh, because government, uh, if you look at the public servants, are uh, being paid uh, very low salaries. And that is, I think, a big issue uh, for corruption. Um, these are some of the points. Shall we pay uh, more salary to the civil servants? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yes. So, uh, I think that one of the, re one of the factors to, uh, in uh, having corruption happen is not very well paid civil servants. And so it's a little bit, it's an easy, it's intellectually lazy to say, well, we shouldn't pay, we shouldn't pay civil servants uh, an exorbitant salary or it, there are easy, it's easy to ape that argument, but if we want to have, if I think about international civil servants, if I think about civil servants at the IMF or civil servants at the World Bank, there's a reason why they're paid relatively well. It's so that they're not, they're not bribable, in essence. Not that any, any one of them would necessarily be bribable, but that they, it's, it sets a standard. It, to the extent that you have well-paid civil servants and you professionalize civil servants, what it means is that uh, it, there's less of a temptation to work uh, either to take bribes or to have other sorts of uh, uh, moonlighting jobs on the side. 
Uh, in particular, uh, one area of focus ought to be professionalizing procurement systems, something like 20% of the gross national product of many uh, developing countries goes through uh, procurement systems every year. But oftentimes, it's, a, it's, not, uh, it's not considered a very prestigious uh, sort of activity and not very professionalized. Uh, Indonesia, I know, for example, is working with the Malayam Challenge Corporation professionalizing its procurement system in the, both at the national and the sub, sub-national level. But I think uh, across the world, this is something that we need to, need to focus on. So we absolutely should be paying civil service uh, competitive and attractive wages and getting good people, because I know, for example, in some of the conversations yesterday, one of the blockages to growth uh, in developing countries is, is the issue of having uh, government capacity, having quality government. Doesn't mean having big government necessarily, but having effective government ne means having well-paid professional civil servants and that are clean to the extent possible. I think it's very important to have an effective government and maybe the higher salary to the civil servants. But if we take Singapore as an example, Singapore's salary for the civil servants among the highest and very factual. But the people tend to complain on that. How could you explain it and persuade the people that it is needed? Well, a couple of things. One is Singapore has great growth. It has, has a, in, it's a very attractive economy. People want to live there. People want to work there. People want to invest there. A, B, there, there's a sense that, and there's a perception in, in, the, in the indicators that Singapore has a lower level of corruption than, say, other parts of Asia. So there's a, in essence, they're getting what they're paying for, which is better quality government and lower corruption and uh, better governance. We will go back to the uh, Singapore a little bit later for the uh, kind of chronic capitalism. Singapore is not an exception. <laughs> and now yeah. we will move to the uh, Stephen. On um, how do global investors uh, its perspective uh, towards Asia in terms of the transparency and anti-corruption fronts. Uh, is this situation and the climate here improving or a, a worsening? So let me be very candid as a native New Yorker. Uh, there are a host of challenges in the region and perception is not great. It is getting better and there are select examples that are terrific and I turn and I cite Myanmar and I look at the awarding of the telecom license process which took place last year. And we think about tone at the top and to say right from the very highest levels in the country from the present on down, could we create a system that would be designed to minimize corruption and to award an important license and to bring in key foreign investment that would have a transformative effect in the country. At the topmost level, great results, but as Serge flagged earlier, when you get down below the top level, at middle and then at very much working levels, there is um, a tremendous gap. So then the issue that comes up, people say, well, in Asia there's simply a culture and you can't change the culture. I would argue to you that that answer is not good enough and the demand, particularly from youth, and if you cite some recent data that comes from um, the Millennium Challenge Goals, when you ask youth what in the 18 to 25 year old bracket is the number one impediment to their own future, you would have thought that the answer might be poverty or education, but the answer is corruption. And that says to me from the bottom up, there is a desire to see a different way of looking at the world. So how do you marry that with a great example in a place like Myanmar, very good work that's happening here in the Philippines, along with tremendous blockages that still exist when I hear stories of people needing to go to a license, uh, to obtain a license and a permit, and then having to pay and pay and pay in order to be able to make that happen. And from the perspective of a foreign investor, as you well know, foreign investors are obliged to follow the laws of the US, the UK, other signatories to their conventions, and they simply cannot operate in that way. So if you're going to have foreign investors be effective in working in the Southeast Asian region, then there needs to be cooperation and a move towards change. It's naive to think that's going to happen overnight, but if we think of it as a journey and a process that goes on over time, where are we on that journey? I would say that there's good progress that's been made, there's good intention, but there's still a long way to go. Yeah, a lot of the uh, big challenges, please. Well, you know, it's, it's cultural. In, in, a, in a way, if you relate it to the problem of, you know, patronage, which, you know, which breeds on, on uh, poverty and uh, as a consequence creates uh, relationships of dependency. And that's why I think uh, 
you know, inclusive development programs that really provide uh, uh, genuine support that leads to the empowerment of uh, uh, not just key sectors but key geographical areas that have been neglected for a long period of time, I think is key. Because uh, if you don't make a significant dent on the problem of uh, poverty, I think the culture of patronage will continue to prevail. And I think that's, it's a problem that we face in, in, in the Philippines. That's why there's great uh, sense of urgency in approaching, uh, for example, the whole challenge of uh, inclusive growth in a spatial and sectoral manner. So really, you know, we begin to develop uh, uh, as, as what Asimoglu and Jim Robinson say, inclusive structures on a small and micro level and scale this up so that eventually, you know, you have a, you move away from a culture of dependency to, uh, you know, some degree of uh, self-reliance, especially for, you know, sectors that uh, historically have been denied access to uh, public services. Yeah, it's very important. Yeah, if I may just uh, add the, the issue of cultural um, sort of um, the, the burden we, we Asians in particular, and probably it's global, but more prevalent in Asia, that corruption is part of the culture. I think it, it's futile to say that's wrong, that's not acceptable, because the fact is that it is part of our culture for a very long time. Um, it has been used as a business tool rather than, than something bad. And to, to change that, I feel that we all must try to change the mindset. Uh, we like to say today that corruption is not a matter of habit. You can't say, I've done this all my life, so there's nothing wrong with it. Or when you look at somebody bribing, you, you feel there's nothing wrong with it. You must raise it to a, to a level where corruption is actually a cancer. It, it's like a cancer cell that will grow and will, you will die. Uh, and if you look at a lot of the emerging markets where they've been successful and become prosperous, many a times the sacrifice is that the gap uh, of poor and rich just gets bigger as they get more successful economically. And one of the main reasons is that the benefits just don't trickle down. They get siphoned off into all pockets instead of trickle down to the people. So while you might have economic success, the people don't actually get the benefits. Very few get become ultra rich. So the majority become, is still as poor or even poorer. And the main reason is corruption. Right? So if we take it as a disease, and you do not view disease kindly, you, you, you tackle with it and you try to eliminate it, then we have a chance. Okay? Like yesterday, uh, this morning, somebody was saying about uh, a minister being asked okay, about corruption. And the businessmen say, well, I don't want to be corrupt, but um, you have to solve the problem because if I'm not paying, my competitors are paying, I would simply not survive. So that brings us to the second part of it, is that how do we solve it? And whether we really have a level playing field, and we just cannot say, don't be corrupt, and while you allow this practice to still go, you really have to go in from the government from to, to, to solve that issue. So I feel that uh, we, we've come a long way as far as corruption, and it's a buzzword. Everybody wants to be anti-corrupt. Uh, but how does countries look at corruption? And today in Asia, it is still not viewed as a cancer. And unless that is raised to that level, it will continue to exist. It's a bit like our, some of our Asian food. It's not healthy, but we've been eating it for, it's only food, for instance. <laughs> we've been eating, eating it for, for generations, so we think it's fine. Now we become health conscious, and suddenly some of the food we've been eating for generations is no good anymore, so you've got to stop eating that food, right? Corruption, I think, is the same. Just wanted to talk about if we if we were in this room 20 years ago, I'm not, I I think we'd have been filled with cigarette smoke. Or if we were in the United States 50 years ago, there would have been cigarette smoke if we met in a hotel. So if we think about corruption in in the ways we think about smoking cigarettes or litter, that there's been a change in mindset. There's been a series of carrots and sticks 
uh, public education campaigns, leadership, uh, that have led to the fact that we don't have cigar any cigarette smokers in this room today. So, in this room right now, in this room right now, you know, I'll have a cigar with you afterwards. But, 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 but the point is that, and I need protection. I feel like, uh, you know, those there's a uh, stigma endangered on you. Species. Yes, you feel like. That. So there's been, there's been a change in the stigma around this concept, this conversation around um, around smoking, and I think there's a changing stigma around the world uh, on the issue of corruption. Uh, and just a couple points. I think that the issue of corruption is absolutely salient in much of the world. I think there was a World Economic Forum survey. 67 of the 144 countries surveyed, it was a top three issue in, every, in 67 countries was the issue of corruption. So I think it absolutely, it touches at the heart of legitimacy, whether it's a democratic government or a non-democratic government in Asia. Um, the, if you don't deal with the issue of corruption, it's, it absolutely puts the, uh, legitimate, the, the, threatens the legitimacy of your government. And so if you're a political leader, I think there's a very strong incentive to, to deal with this issue. I think the fact that this room is full, I think it also speaks to the fact that this is a front and center issue. Um, I also think that there are, it, there are a number of ways we can combat it, and some of it is around this issue of stigma, but um, things like the doing business indicators. So the sorts of economic reforms that in essence reduce the concept of a near occasion of sin, reduce the opportunities for sin to happen to the extent that you don't have to have ongoing um, interpersonal uh, relations with bureaucrats on an ongoing basis, either through things like e-procurement or uh, reducing the number of steps to start a business, the amount of permits, all these sorts of things um, do matter because it reduces the amount of, of corruption that, uh, opportunities, if you will. I can think in another region of the world, in Ethiopia, there was, during, for the doing business indicators of the World Bank, that at one point, if you wanted to register a formal business in Ethiopia, you had to spend $4,000 on publish, publishing an ad in the newspaper in, Addis, in a newspaper in Addis Ababa that you were going to uh, start a formal business. Well, it happened to be that the newspaper was owned by the president's brother, and it was and four thousand dollars, I think, is multiples of whatever the annual income is for most Ethiopians. So, um, you could probably argue that putting it, paying a four thousand dollar advertisement in the in the local newspaper in Addis Ababa probably wasn't necessary for starting a, a formal business. So, reducing the number of steps, reducing the opportunity for corruption, does matter as well. So, the uh, corruption is like a cancer; it's like an addiction. And also, it might be in your body, so it's difficult to, to cope with. Uh, let me uh, give you a, a further, uh, maybe a tricky uh, question about the crony capitalism. Uh, because a, uh, the Economist magazine have established a cronyism capitalism index, uh, which is tracking the, uh, uh, the, the wealth of the millionaires in the, uh, such uh, industries like the uh, mining, like the oil, and like gas, banking casino and also maybe the real estate, which is very dependent on the uh, relationship <coughs> with the government. And they found that they, uh, this kind of index in Asia, including all these Asian countries, it's about twice as that, uh, as that the, the index in the advanced economy, which means that they, it's something in Asian culture. We do uh, have some uh, a kind of uh, a feeling about guanxi. In Chinese, we call guanxi is very important. How can we cope with very uh, a very uh, difficult issue about the culture and also the behavior, habit, and also they maybe ha it, it's, it's, a, it's kind of addiction in, in, in this area, if I may ask the young, young global leaders. <laughs> I think um, the culture, uh, yeah, accepting uh, uh, the culture is wrong. I mean, to start with, because uh, you, need to, you need to move forward you need to sort of uh, move into a better culture because you can't accept the culture of uh, you know, facilitation fees or lobbying fees or political financing. Let me give you an example. Um, now you have the asset declaration of politicians before the elections. Um, what's the use of just declaring your assets? You, you need to analyze the assets from first election to the next election. You need to analyze the growth for example, you have five vehicles in the first election, you have 50 vehicles in the next one. So you can draw up a graph. You can do quantification. So quantification is really important. Uh, we don't do quantification at all. And uh, individual uh, citizens can be empowered to quantify data. For example, uh, your, uh, your phone can have a tool, a small tool, where you can write 
I paid a bribe to this person mm. uh, without the names. But you can quantify this police station is corrupt than the other police station. This department inside the government uh, ministry is corrupt, which helps the government. So these are tools that can be, uh, you know, sort of uh, implemented easily. But you need to have the political will. The issue is there's no political will. There's lack of political will. In this entire region, I see um, uh, there, are, there are many, um, I mean, governments that come into power and all that, they talk about it, but um, are they actually doing it? Uh, Singapore is a shining example, I think, uh, being number five in the CPI index, I think, uh, a shining example of fighting corruption. Because you don't need a, a, a arrest warrant to take somebody in. You don't need, uh, the, the Bureau of Sing uh, Singapore can investigate immediately or anybody. You don't need any sort of, uh, so I think that is enforcement, actually practicing um, anti-corruption mechanisms. So that's really important to uh, empower individual citizens because it doesn't happen vertically. So you've got to play it horizontally. So I think that's important. Yeah. Well, I, th I think the way you approach it depends on how you characterize the, the problem yeah. beyond, beyond being a, uh, a management or a technical issue. Uh, as in the case of the Philippines, uh, uh, th this problem is, is a fundamental structural problem that's rooted in its uh, colonial history that eventually bred a system of oligarchy in this, in this country. You know, this Aquino administration is different in the sense that uh, it came to power really without being absolutely hostage or without having to ponder to manage interests. Uh, to, to ascend to power. In fact, it rode on the outrage of, of a people that's been completely uh, frustrated with the regime that has mismanaged this, this country. And as, as a result, uh, uh, President Aquino is leading a state that we can say or characterize as being relative, relatively autonomous from, uh, from this you know, narrow self-interested groups. And as a result, the state can behave like, you know, the disruptive state that, that it is right now. And I think that's very key if you want uh, real changes, you know, how, to what extent, because considering the uh, very strong influence of uh, elements that resist change, and, you know, the limited capacity of uh, countervailing forces from civil society, from concerned businessmen from enlightened politicians, I think it, 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 you know, the, the state has to take it upon itself to provide that leadership. And I think that's really what is happening to the Aquino administration right now. Can I? So, yeah, sure. You first. Uh, I think I'll just add to your question, and how do you break this culture of uh, uh, chronic capitalism? I think the reason why it's still so prevalent, at least in, in Indonesia, is because um, it's all about cost and benefit, right? I think the cost of um, maintaining this relationship are still considered cheaper um, than the opportunity that we have lost by ma not maintaining this relationship. So I think one of the key areas that we need to think about is how do you make it expensive for these people to actually um, main, you know, rely on capitalism to do business? And there are several examples that we can do it. You know, if in Indonesia, like to be successfully growing your company in a big scale, people talk about relationship and financing, right? So how do we um, engage the financial services sector, for example, to be more prudent when they are giving financing to these companies on ethical standards that the company are actually um, deploying in their respective companies? And secondly, I think as a... Um, young person, I think I've been surrounded by a lot of young people who are, who are not accepting the culture, as Asanga said. And one good example that I think I can showcase is a friend of mine who actually joined a major company. And very quickly, he realizes that to get things done, you actually need to bribe the local officials. So he decided to leave the company because this is not the type of um, environment that he wants to be surrounded under. Um, and if you look at Indonesia today, um, one of the key challenges for businesses to grow is talent. So I think this is one of the areas that I would say that talent crunch is actually a good thing. Um, because I think going forward, if companies cannot um, show these young people that they can operate in a cleaner, 
um, um, in a more fair way, they will actually also uh, find it difficult um, to get young talent to fill in the middle management positions, which is also an inhi inhibitor for growth, and yet there is a price to it. The young, young people will change our future. Well, Again. In terms of raising the cost, <clears throat> sometimes it's not going to necessarily be uh, a, legal, a legal pathway to raise the cost. It's going to be uh, having an independent civil society that's going to ra raise a red flag and say this, something's wrong here. Or it's going to be independent media that's going to say there's something wrong here. Not so much just naming and shaming, but also looking at some of the, the root causes of corruption as well. But I do think that having, having independent civil society and independent media are an important part of raising the costs on, on corruption because I do think there is a stigma attached to it and an increasing stigma <laughs> attached to it. Um, in terms of, sorry, in, in terms of, in, in terms of uh, this issue of crony capitalism, I, I wanted to just suggest two two additional things to think about. One is, how do we encourage entrepreneurs to participate in entered <coughs> markets? But second, how do we use trade agreements? I'm thinking of here in this region, the TPP <coughs> is being negotiated. To what extent do we use, do we include anti-corruption chapters in TPP? Uh, I can think of other examples in the United States uh, with bilateral trade agreements, such as uh, the U.S.-Panama Free Trade Agreement. I also think the U.S.-Columbia Free Trade Agreement. Or the accession of Russia, which is not exactly a great example right now. Uh, but if you look at their accession to the WTO, there were a series of steps they had to meet in terms of on anti-corruption issues. So we should be using trade agreements um, to force, uh, use, political leaders in, in, in domestically should be using these trade agreements as vehicles to force uh, opening up of their markets and perhaps diluting the, the influence of crony capitalists. But Dan, that's, that's already happening to an extent in the sense that big corporates that are operating in these markets as they go further and further down their supply chain, they're demanding that their local partners meet certain standards that are expected. And that, in turn, creates a, a bigger reservoir of those who are playing by the rules. So I look at that on the one way as a driver. But on the other hand, you ask the question of a parent, what do you want your child to be? And 20 or 30 years ago, you might have asked that to parents. And they would have said, I want my child to go into government because I think I can make the most money being in government. In an ideal world, and I think it is moving this way today, when people ask that same thing, they want their child to be in business. The next Steve Jobs or the next, the next entrepreneur. And if that change in culture is, is taking root at that level, what is the aspiration and how do I get ahead, then that's a very strong indicator. But that needs to be complemented as it appears to be here in the Philippines with an understanding that there is an absolute commitment to driving the anti-corruption agenda, both being able to put in place what you need when it happens to create a mechanism of uh, punishment so there is not impunity. But even more important than that, what can you be doing proactively in order to try to prevent corruption from happening before? And we heard in one meeting yesterday a fantastic story of how um, a corrupt set of circumstances took place in Thailand. And it was all completely predictable what would happen. And at each of the steps along the way, it could have been prevented had there been the means. After the fact, it was then done and prosecuted. So how do we move from being reactionary to being proactive? And I think that's the fundamental question in the region and more broadly than just here. Yeah. I think uh, there's a buy side and a sell side in corruption. Mm. And you really have to deal with both sides simultaneously and with the same degree of force. Sometimes we concentrate too much on the buy side, meaning talking about government officials being corrupt and so forth. Okay? And we neglect the sell side. Um, as if the people who are bribing were forced to. Uh, in my opinion, they have a choice to. They have a choice not to bribe and lose the business. Right? Most businessmen would not like that choice. But there is a choice. Okay? So if that buy side is taken care of, you still have to take care of the sell side and vice versa. So I feel that we haven't seen this. Now, a lot of pe pessimism is there. And a lot of discussions I have privately, people say it's impossible to rectify the situation. And I would just like to, for the purpose of everybody to think, uh, provoke this, I'd like to just um, 
bring out one, one of my own experiences. In 1973, I arrived in Hong Kong as a young man. Hong Kong at that time, in 1973, was probably at its height of corrupt, corruption and as a corrupt society. So bad that if you had a fire in a building, the fire engines will arrive and the fire chief will jump down from his engine and say, who's responsible here? And start negotiating how much they'll be paid. <laughs> and if you cannot negotiate properly, the fire engine will drive off. <laughs> and this is, I'm not exaggerating, it actually happens in Hong Kong way back in 72, 73. The whole police force was, was corrupt to the core. And if you have a clean, good policeman, there's only one place you'll find him as the sentry at the main gate of the police headquarters. Because that's where nobody could actually bribe him. He's just pa letting the cars go in and out. Everybody else was corrupt. But look at Hong Kong today. There was a way, a determination, and within 10 years, Hong Kong today can be rated as one of the cleanest places to do business in Asia. So I do not think it's not solvable, not insurmountable. It can be, but it needs a lot of political re resolve and courage. And I hope, like from Myanmar, our president is showing that, and I hope he survives. President Xi Jinping is showing that. I hope he survives too, right? And so is, um, you know, examples like President Aquino, Aquino and many others. I think we just have to hope for the best. I think they will survive, <laughs> especially in China. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Well, I think it's also important to recognize uh, the contributions coming from, from uh, multilateral as well as international uh, organizations. I mean, many, many fundamental changes in the Philippines, for example, the regulation privatization, the uh, dismantling of monopolies, and the development of market-based policies, and to a large extent being the influence of exogenous uh, factors, you know, multilateral agencies. Uh. That's why the Philippines has been uh, very engaged uh, with, you know, with World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, in, in their efforts to promote uh, a good governance, or very recently, the Open Government uh, Partnership, which has now been at the, you know, with about 64 members, vigorously pushing for transparency, accountability, and the engagement of uh, the citizenry in, uh, in governance. I think uh, uh, we do have to recognize uh, the importance of these uh, partnerships because uh, we do learn a lot from them in terms of uh, the way they have uh, uh, dealt with, uh, of course, respecting cultures and uh, contexts, they've been able to effectively deal with, uh, uh, with, 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 with problems of corruption by, you know, leveraging technology, for example, uh, by uh, uh, administrative or technical, or, you know, bur bureaucratic uh, reforms that insulate uh, regulatory agencies from capture. And, they're, they're very important uh, exchanges that uh, the Philippines uh, wants to further cultivate, especially uh, at, at the regional level. And that's why just recently we had the Bali conference hoping to uh, uh, activate further the open government partnership at, at, the, at the regional level. Yeah, so the, the cross-board efforts uh, will help to change the uh, culture and also uh, uh, established the institution. Mm. Let's talk more about the institution. May I uh, raise a, a little bit of provocative question uh, to you, maybe mainly to Stephen and uh, Dan. Uh, is there some uh, similarity between the lobbyism lobbying. And, uh, lobbying and also the chronic capitalism and the corruption? All right, so is there a difference between lobbying and corruption? Um, well, I would say the following. I'd say that uh, in, the, in, the, in the context of the United States, uh, lobbying as a concept is actually enshrined in the U.S. Constitution as a concept. And what, what I mean by that is that um, the U.S. citizens can petition their elected officials to talk to them, uh, to advocate for certain sorts of positions. So there's always been the concept of advocacy and lobbying 
uh, in, in the United States. And if you look around the world in, in most democracy, in democracies, you'll see uh, very sophisticated and increasingly sophisticated ways in which societies are advocating various positions. Um, and so I, I'd start with that. And then I would say that in the case of uh, the way in which we, the United States finances its campaigns, because of the, the, because of the rules around at least uh, listing the, what, what the payments are and what the, what the campaign finances are, I, I think that it's, it is difficult uh, to say that it's exactly bribery, but I would say that um, it's, it, it certainly is very controversial in the United States and raises a lot of issues. Uh, but I think it raises issues more la larger, larger issues around campaign finance necessarily because I'd say most politicians would say they're not taking a bribe if they if they're being if they're visited by a lobbyist who then six months later is participating in a fundraiser for them. They they would say they would say well I don't I, that that's not necessarily the case. There have been cases egregious cases in the United States where politicians have said okay, if you give me this money, I'll, there's a quid pro quo, and they've gone to jail for that. So there, is, there are laws, there's transparency, there's, and there's also consequences for specific quid pro quo sorts of um, activities. And I think uh, many of you, and also inclu including me, have uh, uh, watched a, a, a very famous TV show, which is the, the House of Cards. It's quite <laughs> true. It's <laughs> quite true. <laughs> <laughs> But this is great public diplomacy for the United States, right? It's sort of like the Baywatch for Washington, right? It's an so while, while it is true that the characters on that show live rather well, uh, the, uh, the important distinction, though, is, as I mentioned earlier, was um, in principle. What's going for the private benefit of a politician or of a decision maker? Or is a decision being made for the benefit of the state and its people? And as you're making choices, what's the motivation behind that particular choice? And while there are certainly issues with how campaign finance and uh, lobbying works in the US, I, I think you could say with a reasonable degree of assurance that individual politicians are not pocketing cash that are coming as a result of their decisions for personal gain directly. Television show uh, accepted on, on that one. Whereas what continues to, to concern us, I think, in many of, um, of the countries where there are less transparent activities is a decision is made and someone has achieved personal gain for themselves or their family, and at the same time, that was not in the best interest of the country, or if there was, for example, hospital equipment that wound up being diverted, the funds that were meant to buy the hospital equipment, and those funds wound up in someone's pocket, that means that babies that were meant to have lived mm. will die as a result. So there are real consequences for corruption along the way. And that often doesn't resonate with the people necessarily who are the beneficiaries thereof. Great. Then the, uh, um, we will find some ways to, to set up a good institution. Also, the integrity is the most important thing in, in all this, uh, on top of all these issues. And I think uh, uh, because before we are uh, before we will open the floor to receive the questions from the audience, maybe uh, we can take a few minutes to sum up very quickly by naming uh, one or two or maybe more the, the best, pra best practices when we try to create a, a culture of the transparency, accountability, and also fighting with the uh, uh, corruption. And uh, maybe uh, what, what can young people do in all these fronts? Shall we start with the Sangha? Yeah, I think... Um countries need to sort of move out from their national boundaries when they're uh, fighting corruption. Uh, you can't confine to um, sort of their own boundary, look at it in a sort of nationalistic perspective, but to move out from there and to have submit to regional integration, uh, you have regional frameworks to fight corruption. That's, uh, that should be the way forward. <coughs> but uh, young people can play a huge role uh, in fighting corruption because the tools can be used by young people and uh, they, in reporting bribery, they can introduce new uh, mechanisms to <coughs> fighting bribery. Um, so I think um, overall, uh, there is um, sort of a, a huge role that the younger generation can play to fight corruption. So, um, and also, would you want to name one or two uh, best practices in, in your field or in your country? 
you think will help? Well, one of the tools, uh, you know, let me uh, go, go to India, for example, um, RT, Right to Information Act uh, in India, that gave a huge boost. Uh, for to collect information from government officers, from uh, politicians, from uh, political financing. So it, ha is, it has an individual right uh, <coughs> of the citizen to question uh, how much money did the, the suburb or the regional uh, uh, government use. Uh, this is not still in Sri Lanka, but I think that's a great success story in India. Um, so these uh, amazing uh, tools, for example, uh, I introduced the I paid a bribe. <coughs> now, I paid a bribe is a tool where individuals can report. If you pay a bribe, you can say I paid a bribe to uh, so and so. And um, it's a fun tool also. But the quantification happens behind. Um, so they will know exactly by end of the year that uh, which agencies were corrupt, which places are corrupt. So younger people can actually uh, uh, introduce these sort of tools to the others and you know spread the message yeah. across it's really important new tools yeah. and uh, Ernest um, so I'll just start that um, maybe very briefly yeah sure so I think I'll focus on what youth can do uh, in yeah. particular to drive this and I think a lot of the change in culture um, in many ways are initiated by youth so I think as uh, young people we have the responsibility to actually you know, drive this movement forward, educate the market that put pressure on the government. So you can only be elected to public office if you are promoting clean behavior in the country. And um, a lot of the, uh, there's a lot of movements in Indonesia recently, specifically on this effort in the last legislative election, where we're trying to move towards track record based, um, transparency based um, election. And we actually try to educate people on the candidates themselves as opposed to uh, becoming a popularity contest. So um, I think there is a lot of um, um, activities that we can push on that side. I think the second thing is also that um, the youth should also lead by example. So um, it's not easy um, in the current environment. But one movement that we have started as well in Indonesia is that let's just start with one day in a week you know, where we decide that we are not going to take part in any of this bribery and activity and do everything cleanly and eventually as as we go along it can go to you know do it every day and it gets a lot easier if it, if you do it in stages but i think the last part that um, we'll also need help on is that transparency i think is very important and it's not transparency on whether someone corrupt or not it's transparency of the result like i mentioned earlier i think as youth we need to get assurance that the government has the overall intention to eventually um, improve the public service level um, to the public. So, and, and they are tracked and measured against that. And only if we get that commitment that, you know, the real culture change will actually happen. Yeah, best practice in. Okay. So, uh, pay civil servants well. Yeah. Uh, second, move up on the doing business indicators, reduce the amount of opportunities for corruption. Third, introduce technologies such as the ones that, that were referenced earlier, uh, I paid a bribe or things like e-procurement in government. And then um, fourth, increase uh, overall transparency in the budget making process such as that's been done here in the Philippines. I just want to make one other point about, uh, that's on the government side. On the private sector side, I think what Serge was saying earlier about there's a lot of focus on the government side of this conversation. I do think there needs to be as much of a focus on the private sector side. I think initiatives like Pachi here at the World Economic Forum, they just launched something called the Vanguard Group of Companies. Um, I think also speaks to that we have to raise the, raise the standards. I think Steve was talking earlier about that this is happening through across supply chains around the world as well. Um, so in, initiatives like Pachi, subscribing to Pachi, as well as the UN Global Compact, there's been sort of a, a, a review of the member signatories of the UN Global Compact, uh, and they've removed several, several thousand of them. And they're now at about 5,000. And what Georg Kell says is if he gets to I'm about 20. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, You're sorry. going to have okay. a final word. Okay. <laughs> that is my final <laughs> I'll stop there. I'll talk everyone. Yeah. Yep. Sorry. Well, I, sorry. it's too big a subject. So my final word is just, just that. Just name one or two practices. I think um, we have to stop, do something very concrete on the sell side. In other words, on the business. If you look at all the um, cases of uh, per, uh, prosecution, it's always the government official, the minister, so-and-so going to jail for taking a bribe. Well, throw the guy who gave him a bribe with double the sentence. 
Yeah, and I think a lot of people think twice whether to bribe or not because the government servant may be compelled to take a bribe because it makes a change to his livelihood. But the businessman who's giving a bribe to enrich himself more than he actually needs is the one that actually could, should go to jail twice as long. Yeah, so pay more attention to the sales side. Yeah. Well, in the Philippines, what has worked is the state exerting strong leadership but at the same time working very closely with uh, a, 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 de a developing strong reform constituency. For example, in the business community, they have what is called the integrity pledge. Uh, uh, in the case, of, for example, of the uh, procurement of public works projects, the Department of Public Works and Highways has worked with the, uh, for example, the uh, integrity initiative of the business community so that uh, if you want to bid for projects, you have to attach your income tax return. If you don't, then you cannot. Things like this are, are for me effective. Or for example, working with the uh, environmental groups, uh, pursuing, for example, the national greening program of the government. Uh, they have demanded that uh, for all this long list of uh, greening projects, uh, the, the, uh, the Department of Environment must submit them in an Excel spreadsheet and they have to be have their, every project must have an ID and geotag so that they can monitor the progress of the project. And some are even suggesting now that uh, we use unmanned uh, aerial vehicles, uh, drones, uh, to be able to see not just uh, the usual financial and physical audits, but this time around, and which will be in the budget for next year, uh, visual audits. So you can see you know, if the farm to market road is being built or if how many trees are being planted in mm. a particular area and you can see the longitude, latitudes of that. And yeah. these are innovations coming from the, you know, private uh, sector and from uh, social movements that I think uh, from which the government is benefiting a lot in terms of really promoting uh, uh, transparency and accountability in our program. Yeah, very good. Uh, I would pick up on a practice. couple of things very quickly. The patterns of corruption, particularly on big projects, are generally very well established and, and known. If you have some expertise in this area, it's not hard to figure out how it's done. The question is, do you do the homework in advance to be able to determine where the vulnerabilities are and then to stamp out those vulnerabilities before they happen as opposed to after the fact? Oh, yet again, another case of corruption, let's go prosecute someone. I would say let's go after whether it's the officials on one side or the enablers on the other side to stamp it out before it becomes another example. Yeah, very good. I think now it's time for us to open the floor to receive uh, questions from the audience. Please identify who you are and uh, uh, to whom you would like to raise this question. Is there any questions? Yes, yes please, go ahead. I'd like to address my question to Serge Pan. And uh, the example of Hong Kong is really a great case of, of uh, you know, uh, creating an anti-corruption system that works. And I know one of the things that they did was also do education in addition to the political commitment and the enforcement. They educated even starting at the kindergarten level. And so I'd like to ask you, in terms of, of the region as a whole, how can we do education better in terms of really morals, <coughs> values, and ethics, starting at the, at the young age and even going into business school so that those who go into business have that ethos in them to be honest and not be corrupt? Thank you. I think it's fairly easy if we were to include in the curriculum of all schools, starting from very young, something about how bad corruption is. Uh, um, putting corruption at the same level as a health hazard, as a cancer. And they will grow up with a different concept of corruption, uh, rather than sometimes with the elderly today, uh, you just cannot get their mind around that the life, life can go on without corruption. But I think uh, it is fairly easy if we put into the curriculum. I don't know how many schools in the region or in the world today has a subject about corruption in their textbooks. <coughs> I would doubt it. Uh, but uh, I, I, that would be a very good suggestion, I think. Any more questions? There. There. Yes, please. I'm Trevor Moss with the Wall Street Journal. Uh, my question for Secretary Abad is, how can we be confident that the Philippines is really getting on top of corruption when we have this uh, very serious corruption scandal going on right now, the pork barrel scam, which uh, may now have implicated over 100 
congressmen and senators? How can you convince um, foreign investors, for example, that the Philippines is really on top of this? Even I have been dragged into that controversy. <laughs> but I think uh, if, if, if you look at the environment now, you know, the president has created a real open uh, environment that allows people to freely speak about this uh, problem, which is not the case, uh, you know, in the previous administrations. But, but, but it, the president has not stopped there. It has committed to prosecute uh, you know, all those involved, regardless as to political color. In fact, the instruction to the Secretary of Justice is, uh, you know, follow where the evidence leads you and let the acts fall where it should. And I think, uh, I, I don't think that people doubt the President's commitment to do that. So, you know, this, this environment has been created. And so now you see a lot of people coming forward and exposing all sorts of anomalies at different levels of government and even the private sector. And really, I think at the, at the end of the day, the real challenge is uh, how fast can the uh, judicial process uh, bring to you know, justice and to account uh, all, those that, all those cases that have proven to be with enough evidence for, for them to be convicted for uh, <coughs> corruption. And I, I, I think uh, you know, this is the challenge that uh, uh, we, we're, we're facing, with, but certainly creating an environment and, and, and lowering tolerance for it is, is something that uh, uh, you know, this administration will certainly allow to happen. We at the Department of Budget and Management are, are also looking at this very positively because uh, Nowhere in the previous times has uh, issues about public financial management are being raised every day in, in, in national dailies. And I think that's good for, for, uh, for, for the country because then people are more conscious about uh, you know, the way public funds are being uh, used and managed uh, by government. Yeah, very uh, tough question and a very good answer. I think we uh, do have time for the final mm, somebody question. Yeah, yes, please. Please keep short. Uh, the comment I really wanted to make is the discussion here primarily focused about, the, about bribing, you know, you pay and you take. But I think we really have to see corruption in a much, much wider scale. I think, the, you know, we talk a little bit about the lobbying, we talk a little bit about the other things, but also there are many, many other aspects of, of corruption. And, you know, when we talk about, I think there was a statistics given that the young people are saying this many percentage. Actually, they, they don't only see the bribing is a corruption when that percentage somebody cited there. A lot of young people will also see that having meetings in five-star hotels, they will see as a corruption. You work in a social sector, you come and sit in the five-star hotel. By the way, I come from Red Cross and I'm not staying in this hotel. <laughs> it will be seen as a corruption by young people that you could have done these things in a much better way. So when we discuss this, we really have to see the corruption in a much broader sense than just bribing giving and taking. That's the only point I wanted to make. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. No, corruption is more widespread and more uh, uh, kind of the uh, characteristics. We should work harder, even harder fighting with it. And now I think that we, uh, uh, it's time for us to, to wrap up. Uh, um, by, uh, uh, I will wrap up by asking you a final question, uh, which is what is the number one enemy in uh, <coughs> creating a transparency, accountability, culture and also the fighting with the uh, uh, corruption. Maybe we can uh, start with the young, young global leaders first. Yeah, I think um, if you don't have the political will, you're not going anywhere. So um, that's key for, because the, in, this, um, uh, in this region, so if you have enough, a lot of money, you get elected. Um, people who doesn't have money does not get elected. I mean, the, the percentage is very low. So. I think you need the political will. That's number one because all the other sub, uh, so I would say, uh, indexes are lying on this. And uh, if you don't give the leadership, if you don't give the courage um, to uh, change your agencies, enforce them, uh, empower them, um, so you're not going anywhere. So that's, political that's will. Uh, not to be complacent and to have mm -hmm. courage. And from the courage point of view to say that actually taking <coughs> anti-corruption stance is advantageous for your business. You may lose contracts in the short term, but in the longer term, you're going to be seen better in the light of the marketplace. And that may sound naive, but if that comes 20 years from now, I think that trend line will, will be there. Yeah, long perspective. 
Well, we've been asked, you know, you've started these things and we're seeing, we're reaping the benefits from it. What happens after the president's term? And, you know, my answer has always been, well, it, one is, it depends on how you, you frame the 2016 elections. If it is going to be a business as usual elections, then there's a good chance that, you know, these reforms may, may be put aside. But if we define it as election for continuity of these fundamental changes, then I think people will develop a sense of urgency to think seriously about their choices in 2016. But I think on top of that, what has, what has been a, a, a very important factor in driving the changes, as I said, is, is the fact that you really have a disruptive state here. And we'd like to see the same character reflected in the next state, on the next administration, that will run this country. And I think that's really the challenge for the Filipino people. Yeah, thanks a lot. Serge? The question was, uh, what is the number one enemy hey. to prevent uh, eradication of corruption? Right? And also transparency, accountability. Well, I will, I will second um, the young global leaders whose long name I cannot <laughs> pronounce. <laughs> uh, Sorry. <laughs> that the lack of political leadership and resolve is the biggest enemy. Leadership matters. Leadership. I think ownership, that uh, this is also our job, not only the job of other stakeholders. Ownership. Yeah, yeah that's great. And I uh, think uh, it's time for us to, uh, to close the session. I will uh, share with you uh, very quickly about the, the takeaways. And I think that a lot of progress has been made in, in this region, but there's no room for the uh, complacency. And also, we should have the... Uh, uh, we should have the courage and also uh, the across board efforts are needed. The number one, the political will and uh, the political leadership and also at the same time the higher pay for these uh, civ uh, civil servants and also uh, the, we have the courage and we have the tools and institutional uh, the things to to block and to break the kind of uh, the corruption and also the colonialism and the guanxi, this, this kind of the uh, psyche and also the culture. And finally, I think the young people, the next generation of the leadership will have a bigger and a bigger role in fighting with the corruption and also uh, with the uh, a new environment for the more transparency and more uh, accountability. And uh, thank you so much for the great panel and also thank you for the great audience. Please uh, join me with uh, a big applaud for thank you them. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. When you come to Burma, let me know. I will. Okay. Thanks a lot.